Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this extremely special event. Um, for the for those of you in the room, most of you know me. I'm Sheila Squilanti. I direct the MFA program in creative writing here at Chatham, and I'm saying hello also to the folks who are joining us via live stream. Hello, folks, via live stream. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, we are here tonight to celebrate Cameron Barnett's tenure as Chatham MFA's Emerging Black Writer in Residence for the 2022-2023 academic year. Before we do that, though, I want to point your attention to the flyer you're sitting on. <laughs> or for those of you on, on camera, this is a flyer that announces uh, an event happening here in this room, actually, on October 29th, it's Conversations and Connections, one day writer's conference uh, sponsored by Barrel House Magazine, hosted by Chatham's MFA program since 2014. Um, I won't go on too long about it, except to say that Chatham MFA students and Chatham Humanity undergrad students have a special deal with this conference, and I highly, highly recommend that you take us up on it. It is not, uh, it is not a small thing that you have a writer's conference coming to your own campus. Um, so please do take, take advantage of it. If you have questions about it, please come find me after the reading or sometime next week. OK, so now I want to take a minute to thank some folks. Um, I'll start with the School of Art, Science, and Business, and the Humanities Department, and the MFA program um, as a whole, and also my colleagues uh, inside of those spaces, Dr. Heather McNair, Professor Mark Neeson, Dr. Leah Wilson, um, all who are a very important part of the department, who uh, have helped shape the residency. Um, we are all thrilled to have Cameron as a colleague this year. I also want to thank Joe Bashadi, as always, in the back for his material assistance for all things. Um, and special thanks to our inaugural residents, Caitlin Hunter and Cedric Rudolph, who helped to shape the residen residency in its first year and had some contact with a lot of you. Um, and then further to Nicole Lorette and Samantha Edwards, who were part of the original um, alumni group, who came forward and helped us to um, create, to have the conversations that created the residency in the first place. I want to acknowledge our former student, Jeffrey Boozy Bolden, whose spirit and energy infused this program and his family for allowing us to honor his memory with this residency. The Emerging Black Writer in Residence program aims to support the art and teaching of black writers by providing teaching and mentoring opportunities within our MFA community. It also provides them with professional mentorship that is individual to their own interests. As our resident, Cameron Barnett is teaching one of our foundational courses, The Craft of Creative Writing, to our MFA students first year. In the spring, he will join the Fourth River Masthead as tributaries editor, and will have a chapbook of his original poetry published as the second title in the Boozy Bolden chapbook series. Finally, he will join us at the Summer Community of Writers, where he will be in residence to work on his own poems, hopefully, that's the plan, um, and also spend time with students in various ways. We are so fortunate to benefit from his many talents and to share in community with him for this year. And now, as is our tradition, I'm going to invite um, one of our MFA students, first year student Whitford Fellow Halsey Heyer to the podium to introduce Cameron's reading. Thanks again, everyone, for coming. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you and all of you um, for joining us tonight to celebrate our third emerging black writer in residence, uh, Cameron Barnett. Um, let's just take a moment to clap for him. I also want to take a moment to say thank you to our program director, uh, Sheila Squilanti, uh, for inviting me to introduce Cameron this evening, uh, not only because his work is some that's worth celebrating, but also because of his keen editorial eye, his compassionate and diligent approach to teaching, and his fervor for creativity and all things Pittsburgh. All of these aspects and more are what makes his place as the 2022-2023 emerging black writer in residence beyond well-deserved. So just some personal remarks, um, because my working relationship uh, with Cameron began actually in 2018, um, whenever he, uh, Ziggy Edwards, uh, Dakota Gorilli, uh, Nicole Lorette, Wendy Scott Paff, and Eli Kurzlaski invited me to join them as an associate editor for the Rest in Peace uh, Pittsburgh Poetry Journal. Um, and 
There we uh, had the opportunity to feature work that clinged with grit and passion, celebrated and broke traditions while striving for progress, and spoke to the spirit of Pittsburgh from not just this corner of the world, but all corners of the world. Um, working with him and the rest of the editorial team on the Pittsburgh Poetry Journal was very formative in my writing life as it was my first ever editorial gig. Um, I was just a junior at Carlo University, and I uh, was only 22, <laughs> so they believed in me, um, and for that I say thank you, truly. Um, even though the journal has since closed, as I said, um, I do cherish the skills and experience working alongside him and the others on the journal uh, that it's afforded me. Um, and then last year around this time, I did have the privilege of taking a private uh, chapbook workshop at White Will Bookstore uh, called Following the Thread. And there as a class, we worked uh, to support each other in following the poetic threads within us. And there, Cameron taught me about what it means to unspool the thread within me onto the page in a communal and cohesive way that challenges and honors a work original intention or form. He fostered an environment there which has left me with foundational friendships with other writers that I'll carry with me, I believe, forever. So thank you. Um, they've even helped me move. <laughs> um, I truly had no idea that Cameron would be my professor probably until like two weeks before school started. Um, and I was thrilled <laughs> uh, to share the literary space with him uh, yet again. We are all truly lucky to have him here and it's an honor to introduce him to all of you tonight. Um, so just a bit about uh, Cameron before I turn things over to him. Cameron Barnett is a poet and teacher in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. A quasi-native of the city, he graduated from Taylor Alderdice High School and went on to receive his BA in English from Duquesne University in 2011, where he was the recipient of the O'Donnell Award for Excellence in Poetry. He beholds both an MFA and MFA M.A.T. from the University of Pittsburgh, where he was a poetry editor for Hot Metal Bridge mag Literary Magazine, co-coordinator of Pitt's Speak Easy Reading Series, and winner of the 2014 University of Pittsburgh and Academy of American Poets Graduate Poetry Award. He served as an editor for Pittsburgh Poetry Journal and serves as a board member for Write Pittsburgh. Cameron's poetry explores the complexity of race and the body for a black man in today's America. He is the recipient of a 2019 Investing in Professional Artists Grant Program, a partnership of the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Heinz Endowments. He is also a 2019 Emerging Artist Awardee for the Carol R. Brown Creative Achievement Awards, co-sponsored by the Pittsburgh Foundation, oh, excuse me, um, and he is the author of Drowning Boy's Guide to Water, winner of the Autumn House Press 2017 a Rising Writer Contest, and the finalist for the 49th NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Literary Work and Poetry. Cameron currently teaches middle school English language arts and social studies at his alma mater, Falk Laboratory School, and his second collection of poems, Murmur, will be published by Autumn House Press in the spring of 2014. Uh, put your hands together for Cameron Barnett. You all are too kind. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sheila and Halsey, uh, for that very warm introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here, uh, to be a colleague to all the instructors, instructors at Chatham, um, and to follow in the footsteps of Caitlin and Cedric, um, but most importantly, Boozy, um, who's an incredible artist who I really miss. Um, I always get like weird about hearing all the things I did <laughs> read aloud, um, but I want you to know the most important thing to me is for those of you on the live stream, also hi, thanks for joining. Um, in this room is my former high school teacher, some of her students who are currently at Alderdice, one of my former students from Falk, and current students I'm teaching at Chatham, and I just feel really honored to be able to read to all of you <laughs> tonight because as I always joke, this book of poems I wrote on the couch in grad school thinking, I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with this. These are stories that matter to me. And then everything has come from that. So I don't take it for granted to be able to be at this microphone with you all. Okay, poems, poems, we're gonna do poems now. All right. Um, I always like starting with this poem. It's early on in the book. Um, it's called To the Octopus. I got cold cocked in the mouth once by a kid blacker than me for talking white to him outside the cafeteria. 
lost four teeth to the tiled hallway, painted a stripe of red down my shirt. I'd speak of the pain, but I'm telling you a story you already know. I have seen you cling to coral so tight, you become every color all at once. Camouflage is essential. We know this, but when I watch you, I realize how you can squeeze through most things if your mouth fits just right. I'm still learning. I held half my mouth in a sandwich bag when my father picked me up at school, couldn't tally each tooth in the blood-smeared plastic, asked me, what did you do? I'm trying to be more like you now. The other day, I passed a brick wall, imagined my arms fourfold, pressed my palms to it until there was no air, but I didn't turn tan. Later, I stood on a packed bus, coiling my arms around the railing, still black. How do you shoot skin out of your body? I have seen you leave limbs behind, each a little brain distracting predators. You think of anything to stay alive. I have to mind my mouth and limbs in public. They don't grow back. My mother stayed in the operating room for hours. I was so sedated, she stayed by my side and never ate. I woke up to the dentist teasing her about the churn in her stomach. It was louder than my drill. Mothers will starve for us. They know this. Hunger as second nature. Being eaten is what they call love, isn't it? My gums leaked well into the summer. I stopped brushing for weeks. Too many toothbrushes left and peppermint swirl. My mouth unchanged, save for the cursing of that kid's name. Maybe if my blood were blue, I'd have three hearts like you. One for forgiving. One for forgetting. One for moving on. Watching you now, I know why you blacken the water and run. Um, <clears throat> so in my bio you heard, I write about uh, black experiences to be a black man in today's America. Um, but I also write a lot about family and other relationships. And I think for me, relationships in general are sort of my like fascination point in poetry. Um, and so I'm always sort of tackling this question of who are we? Who are we to each other? Um, who are we to ourselves even? Um, so this is uh, kind of one of those poems to, um, it's called Firefly. This summer belongs to the little lamps without gravity, flickering in and out of the night faster than the stars. I watch them dance across the grass like constellations coming alive. For so many summers, this is all I've had, Dad. Tonight, I pull out the old chessboard Black plastic bishops snapped, teeth on rooks' crowns cracked. You set your pieces, handing me the black ones as always. Even as a boy, you made me go last, taught me some games take patience. I could never defeat you. Back then, I once asked where the light and a bulb came from. <clears throat> you told me great people went to the sky and caught enough stars to make the earth glow. Stars that couldn't be tamed became fireflies. Every summer we played chess, you never let me win. At times between moves, the board held dust like snowfall. I'd sit outside and name the fireflies, never telling you about all the constellations I found. I didn't want you to know I was studying their swift flight, how I was learning the patterns, quick flash, long smolder, how long before the flickers matched up then fell apart. I used to wonder if light ever grew tired of moving faster than anything. Now, after a quarter of my life, I still don't know where the stars belong. We revisit these broken pieces. White pawn, black knight, white bishop, black king. You give the same stale opening moves and in an hour I've beaten you. You turn to leave, still not letting me win. I have learned all there is to patience. I want to take everything you think you taught me and teach you what I've learned. One of my muses throughout the book that comes up probably two, three, maybe four times is um, Emmett Till. Um, and this next poem is a really sort of direct <laughs> address of Emmett Till um, and his story. It's called Crepe Soul Shoes. One, you were anchored fast by the cotton gin fan, pinning your head in shoal. 
barbed wire plated around your collar. Tell me how still the water was, squashed bullfrog for a face. Did the fish notice you? Did they nuzzle your cheeks or scatter? Tell me how the river broke around your bloated body for days. Tell me where it was deepest. Two, how many buttons were on Mrs. Bryant's dress? Tell me how it clung to her behind the register. Were you really so cocky? What did you say to her? Did you make eyes at her? Skin the color of cracked pearls? Call her baby? Why? Tell me it isn't true. You didn't sass her. It was Mississippi and you were just a nigger buying gum. Three. When was the last time Mammy ever called you Beau? 14 years old. Today, you could be my grandfather. I want to put you back together, but how can I rebuild you? In Chicago, you left your watch, took your father's ring and the train to money. That summer of 55, the rails beneath you steadily pinned down the Illinois horizon. Were you ever afraid? Four. Bryant and Milam wrapped their trial tongues in stars and bars. Old Uncle Mose pointed a finger as tired and strong as every Southern black. In the jury room, white men laughed and drank pop to stall, just enough to look good. Months later, $4,000 and a confession. Damn, if that nigger didn't have crepe sole shoes, you know how hard they are to burn? Five. Was Orion watching down from the sky or Libra? the night they snatched you? Who did you miss most when they took you to their shed? You were tied up like meat, hands numb up to the wrists while they took turns smashing your face. He chopped your nose with the pistol butt, crammed his fingers in your socket, pulled your eye out down to your cheek, rested, then threw you back into the truck. They Picassoed your face, took it to the backwoods, that hillside slope. How do you scream when no one cares? Six, muddy water caught the bullet spilling out from your head. Your corpse broke the Tallahatchie waves. And splashing, you sparked a powder keg of Negroes who marched well after your lungs became thermoses clawed with Mississippi shame. When your picture hit the newspapers, even white America doubled over and groaned. Seven, they say your whistle curdles the wind in Montgomery. They say the sidewalks or heavy with your footsteps in Selma. They say after a storm in money, the ground turns pink in memory of you. I'm gonna do something I haven't done in a while. <laughs> so my book is divided into two parts. I'm gonna to try to pull us back out of that really heavy moment <laughs> that we just had, um, or divided into three parts, I should say. And the middle part uh, is called From the Bones We Lose, which Unless you come see me at a reading, you have no idea what that refers to. <laughs> and it is a chapbook in progress that I was working on during this that um, takes up Yusuf Komunyaka's um, series of poems called The Thorn Merchant, which I absolutely love, <laughs> um, and does sort of like a close imitation of them. Um, basically, the point is there's this guy who's like the most decrepit creature in the world, and you only learn about him through his interactions and relationships with other people. So I want to read a couple of these poems from the middle, because I never do. The Note Broker. His eyes are the color of cracked crayons rubbed end to end. In the alleyway, he lies way down, thinner than a nine-cent dime. His hand catches the slick of a magazine, pulls it up hoping for sheet music. Instead, he reads about the pieces that were cut from the Shroud of Turin. His hands hold crumpled corners of pages, Fingers dotted long ago with paper cuts from a love letter. A bone inside a bone is breaking. There are small memories at work between thumb and forefinger. He knows the more a thing is understood, the more it is destroyed. In the distance, a trumpet blares asthmatically, his blood crooning around each failed note. Beyond the brick wall, people are, lap people are talking. The type who speak only from the neck the type who don't know a song from an echo. But the words inside him are not these. The chip on his shoulder is made of sawdust. Their song is not his, which is to say every rib in his body 
is a tuning fork waiting to be struck. The Accomplice. None other than the Bishop of Blues, AKA Hank the Hot Stepper, godfather of brass and barbells, flexing that shark skin double-breasted suit with matching trumpet case. It's no wonder he rolls into town on white wall tires with more pep than 76 trombones in the morning sun. Manhole covers rattle like snake tails and spit sewer steam on his black suede shoes. With nothing but a shrug and a swagger step, he brings out sinners in a septic city, shaking tempest hard, and for a time, people are weak-kneed, wailing like ten-foot tubas. When he enters the Omni, he casts a wily wink toward karma, orders an old-fashioned, and sips real smooth. Never mind her kiss clotting in his heart, a black spot sinking in like a splinter, or the Jankowski men high and tight on his neck where his close shave stops. The thick sheen of an axe handle flashes in his eyes. Could have seen it coming. He's at the coat check whistling Sweet Home Chicago, and no one speaks while the mob moves outside like a rugby scrum, backlit in scarlet. The hot stepper's teeth fill in the cold cracks and cobblestone. A pale horse clip clops the street, while inside a high note hits the air, ringing like a syllable for revenge. I love reading that poem. I just had to. Um, yeah, here's another one, kind of on that relationship vein. This is, uh, I don't know who's on the live stream, so I'm going to keep it slightly PG, but this is an FU poem. <laughs> um, and you'll see what I mean when I finish it. Uh, the first, the name of this is Baby, and the first, the title goes into the first line. Baby, I'm scared our kids will come out splotchy. My girlfriend, M texted me after we spent the morning naming, was it four or five boys she wanted? After my thumbs grew numb from exchanging ideas from opposite ends of campus, and if you're thinking that I went off and ended our relationship on the spot, you're wrong, because I pretended I never got the message. And when she didn't bring it up again, after I got to the library, we slipped into a steady study since it was November and finals were coming up, and we became a new twist on that age-old American vision of college two kids right out of MLK's dream speech. And the point is, I saw the list of baby names doodled down the margins of her notes, clusters of hearts, and another boy's name we hadn't discussed, one I knew. And the point is, I bought her coffee when it got late and spit out requisite I love yous whenever we'd look up from our work. My girlfriend thinking mixed children were our biggest threat, which I guess she could because I didn't teach her what being black and spotted means, that it isn't the melanin sales rep stock in stores, and it isn't the melanin they pull the trigger for, and because I wanted love then too much for my own good, I could only wonder if she would become the kind of white woman who pull her children close to her when they saw albino blacks in public, the security of a Caucasian kid yanking at her heart, or if she would learn to let herself be filled with humility, but more importantly, would I become the kind of black man who believes dignity is worth more than affection, or that there's a love where they coexist, though I'm not sure I'm there yet, but regardless, M, wherever you are now, I want to let you know I got your message, but I pretended it never came because I didn't want you to cheat on me or cheat on your test, which you did anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to read maybe one or two more from the book, and then I want to read some newer, newer work for you all. Um, in fact, because there are people here who I know watched this show when it was actually on, I'm going to read a poem called Fresh Prince, which <laughs> when I get the opportunity to visit high schools and other places, I'm like, do you all know like the real Fresh Prince? So, Fresh Prince. Now this is a story all about how, watching the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you realize you don't know yourself. You know your sister is Ashley, your cousin is Hillary, your brother is Jazz, your mom is Aunt Viv, the second one. Should have been the first clue. And you know this from the palms outside their house that look like the palms around your block. And the palms of their hands are two-toned, like your palms and your hands. And that bald, big-bellied Uncle Phil bears an uncanny resemblance to your father. And Bel Air bears an uncanny resemblance to your childhood city, but you don't know who you are, so you assume you are Will. Soft smile, smooth talk, ripe reflection of the kind of blackness you wanted. Watch the Fresh Prince growing up in Orange County while Will started off 
in West Philadelphia, born and raised, but you were born in Fullerton and raised in Pittsburgh and mostly around white kids, which made it easy to be the black one. Easy to assume you're the black one in everything they knew and saw. Hard to know why they love Fresh Prince so much when it was really just a show about your life. Hard to figure out what any other kid could have seen in your life that you couldn't. Chilling out, Maxim, relaxing all cool in your corduroy pants and crew neck sweaters. New electronics under the Christmas tree every year. Braces to set your whole mouth straight. The lecture dad gave you about do-rags one time even though it was a bandana he found in your laundry. The lecture dad gave about grills even though you never wanted any. Wondering to yourself, who made dad the family judge? The big clean house holding all of it together. Couldn't other kids see that you were Will? Mia Long Dayton, class clown, inner city steez with your no rule breaking, no back talking, articulate bookworminess, late night poetry writing stanza after stanza asking, do I really know, know myself? Like the page was a mirror and the reflection you began to see was Carlton. Clean cut Poindexter, but darker skinned. Philip Banks protege, however resistant. College bound from birth and broken like a horse of a sun. Not a daring bone in your body, though your heart beat with the bravado of a defiant Philadelphian or the eloquence of his silver-tongued cousin, and it's so hard to tell. You don't know yourself until you watch the episode when Will and Carlton get trapped together on the side of a mountain, and you realize the mountain is a place behind your ribs, and the two of them are shades of the same black boy who has been dueling himself inside you season after season, and you begin to question if you've had it backward this whole time. While Will goes east to west coast, you go from Cali to PA. And while Will's passing time in cool places, you are making yourself cool and passable in white spaces, pleasing your family. And it's not until you've watched a thousand hours of the show, until the phrases fresh prince and model minority become close cousins, until you see how the Banks boys didn't understand Phil's southern roots, Selma Soldier, Watts Witness, that you question if you've ever been that black that Will brings to Bel Air making trouble in my neighborhood, or even eastbound Carlton Black, <clears throat> prepped and primed for Princeton. I got in one little fight and my mom got scared. It only clicks when you realize you were always more Carlton and that it's okay. When you realize Uncle Phil loved both boys to death and stood as a model minority for both of them. So you could reconcile that Fresh Prince is just a name for the love both boys seek from the judge just an inheritance every black boy seeks for himself, and it only clicks when a poem about a TV show becomes a way of telling your father, I didn't always understand, and I still don't always understand, but I'm starting to see a bit better. All right, new work. Um, these are poems that will appear in um, my forthcoming collection, Murmur, uh, also with Autumn House, shout out to Autumn House. They're the best, I love them. Um, let's see. I cut a sprig from a rosemary plant and two more sprigs bloomed. I cut one of the new sprigs and out came a thumb a lot like mine. I cut the thumb and out spilled blood. I cut the blood and out came a flag. I cut the flag and the firework emerged with a smoldering fuse. I cut the firework and the bill of rights came spilling out. I cut the parchment and there appeared my face. I cut my face and out came thumping my teenage heart. I cut my heart and out came my mother's murmur. I cut her murmur and a blade sliced back at me. The blade cut my hand and my own blood spilled into the rosemary pot. The blade cut the soil and Aquarius sprang up and into the sky. The blade cut the water bearer and a flood came down. The blade cut the flood, but the flood cut back, sharpening itself until the blade and the water merged and became a needle. I picked up the needle, poked it through my palm and heard my father cry for the first time. I sewed and sewed and sewed, but the thread kept cutting a hole in my hand wider and wider, and it sang as the thread passed through, and the song was a heartbeat filling in the pauses in between my own. I cut the thread, and the hole closed, and the crying stopped, and the water dried, and the only thing left was this song. It cut me open. It made a subwoofer out of my chest. Even now, when the doctor lays the stethoscope on me, she says, there are two hearts, 
talking over each other. <coughs> a second opinion. 1619, 1776, 1865. Because of these, I am. A rope rocks empty in the wind somewhere in Sumter because it never loved me. Maybe life is all fire and parlor walls. Still, I go on dreaming of writing a green book for the stars. Take me to Mars and tie my tongue up in tectonics. Then let me be redshifted into oblivion. This much I believe. The future doesn't have a price yet. A place is not who owns it. No book will make you love me. 1955, 1965, 1987. My heart is the space between boom bap, dap, and desperation. Sometimes I dream of a blacker me, and I know it is a dream because I can't see faces clearly in dreams, but I know a nesting doll just like I know the panic of a dream ending from its rush and repetition. The night sky and the earth go on lying back and forth to each other, and from where I sit between them, I learn that stubbornness won't make me love me either. 1996, 2001, 2012. A road runs north from Langdon because it desperately wanted me to be. This much I know. A place is more than its truth. Some people have always known freedom. They aren't the only ones fit for it. All right, I'm gonna close with two more poems, if that's cool. Um, I really like writing poems that interrupt themselves, and also poems where you kind of admit things that are like small, but kind of big at the same time. <laughs> And I try to do both of these in this poem, <clears throat> so it's called Pardon. If my friends knew how much I danced in the shower, they'd judge me. Pardon me, Earth, for all the water I've wasted. Pardon me for the spit in my mouth I give back to make up for it. I've been told to make amends when possible. The side effect is this heart of mine, caught up in shrinking and growing. Pardon, groaning. Pardon, gloating. This is why I dance in the water, to make joy something precarious, pardon, precious, to learn to love the threat of slipping, of losing balance. If my friends knew that I could never throw away sentimental things without kissing them goodbye, they'd laugh about me, pardon, laugh at me, and give names to anything I touch. How do we learn shame for our little rituals? Everyone I know walks backward out of, the dark, out of dark rooms and basements because we all know haunters, pardon me, monsters that make us shudder. We are the strength we practice. I practice writing poems not meant for profit, pardon profit, pardon private. I don't go to mass, but privately, I do the sign of the cross sometimes when I need grounding, when I need to hold on. There's this earthquake I keep in my pocket. I pray I never show anyone. I'm okay letting myself get torn apart, pardon, in part, because I might deserve it. If my friends knew that I haven't always been a good man, I wouldn't bother asking them to pardon me. Arrogance and freedom are close cousins of mine. I have this little ritual, recalling all the last times I didn't realize were lasts at the time. Full hands, a full heart, kisses that weren't farewells, the echo of heat that is thunder. Maybe I am what I fear follows me out of the dirt. Pardon, dark. I fear I am an earthquake. I fear when I finally crack, the earth will tell you from above and below. Um, and I want to end on this poem because it's for my sister, and I love my sister. I don't know if she's watching. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, though. Um, this one's called Because. Because I've always been better at word games. Because my sister has always been better at Mancala. Her hand, a shifty, surly, scooping sidewinder, dipping into the pockmarked mahogany between us at 12 and 10 apiece. Her hand, a constant passing back and forth around the board. My hand, better shaped for pen and paper. Because picking up pieces means knowing where to place them. 
because we are pieces of the people who came before us, because ancestry is more plink Plinko than Pac-Man. Yet this redistribution she is so good at, like something in the blood, has made mine boil just watching her snatch away every last glob of glass into the end pit. And I've marveled at how easy it is for her to get there because it takes so much movement to wind up where you're headed. Because Mancala means movement. Because she'd drop her last stone in her store and say, eat your heart out. And I'd try in vain to prove her wrong and always so too short and fill the remaining spaces with words I wasn't proud of. Because every game is still a word game to me. And I could give the definition of countenance or easily spell nauseous correctly on command, but I couldn't seem to count my moves correctly. And isn't this what family is for? Wasn't our blood picked up and dropped here, moved all around this continent just to arrive where we are? What's the word for that? I'm asking because at 28, in the evening of my youth, I'm only just learning that words aren't everything. Because even though these childhood games are still fresh in my head, I still wish for my sister to pick us up like little pieces of glass and place us right back there. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if anyone has a question for me or anything they want to ask or anything, but I'm happy to take questions. Um, there's another short poem um, in the Drowning Boys Guide to Water that does it more like um, disruptively than that. And I, I think for me, something that I think about with my writing and I often talk about uh, with students is that I like poems that feel like a conversation. And conversations have different cadences and rhythms to them. And when you're actually talking with someone, like you're really getting into something with them, like that's kind of like your thought process coming out. And so I kind of like every once in a while mimicking that or imitating it in a poem to see like what that does to the rhythm of a piece of poetry um, as like a conversation with some reader. Thanks. Halsey. <laughs> yeah, um, I think for me the thing about Komenyaka's work in general, but especially in that series, is just how he just deftly treats imagery. <laughs> Um, and just like small turns of phrases that just like can flip the meaning of something for you like in an instant in a line. <clears throat> so I was trying to do that a lot. Um, but another quality I would say like to me it's like those poems are like a rogues gallery of like characters and like they have a film noir kind of like <laughs> sinisteriness around them. Um, but again that's something that I was trying to lift or at least I was seeing in Komenyaka's work that I was trying to lift out of like this character who's just so um there's there's a backstory that you don't get to directly have told to you you have to like wind your way around it and find it out just felt so like i don't know like you're sitting with a story and dealing with it in episodes um so that's what i was trying to deal with and i don't know i'd have to go back and look to see what i left out but i was obsessed with yusuf komenyaka in grad school so i probably used a lot of what he was doing too um he also the reason why it's in this book um, I don't think I've ever told anyone this, but he has a collection called Neon Vernacular, um, and 
that's where I first found these poems, but I didn't know his other books before then. And I realized he'd actually spread these out over a series of books. And I was just like, whoa, how cool is it to have like a series of poems over a series of books that all like connect to each other. And so my secret hope is like to do that too. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> questions I could also read that poem if you want it's really short if you want to hear the interruption poem um, where is it it's called Cygnus you might have picked up that I really like dropping um, constellations in my poems it's just a fun thing what is the opposite of water a skeleton frowning three femurs in a ditch a honeycomb filling the gooey heart holes, spilling what is the opposite of a parade? A familiar voice, thunder cracked across the sky, a crow's tongue split into the crow speaking short, stabbing sentences, making what is the opposite of a guess? Love in the form of a mistake, me and you in the form of Cygnus in July, or perhaps Draco, but there seems to be what is the opposite of a constellation? a quorum of light receding from where we are to where we came from, two mirrors facing, facing each other, shattered. So, and that on this one formally too, like the questions stand out and then the rest of the poem kind of has its own body. If there are no other questions, I want to thank everyone for, for coming out tonight. I think we still have some snacks back there and refreshments. I need some vegetables, <laughs> so I'm going to get in there. Um, but no, I really appreciate you all coming. This has been a real treat to, to read, so thank you very much. One last note. There's my sweater. Thanks, Cameron. Um, one more plug. First, thank you again, Cameron. That was a wonderful reading. Again, we're so happy to have you here. Um, and you can get more Cameron if you come to Conversations and Connections because he is going to be one of the featured authors. So he'll be sitting up here giving a bit of a reading, talking to these other fabulous people, Saida Agostini, John Vircher, and Wendy Wimmer. So please join us then and come say hello and thank you. And there's Cedric. I didn't see you here. Hi, Cedric. <laughs> Hello. That's it. Goodbye, live stream. Thanks, guys. <laughs>